Jesus, Jesus, today is the day of salvation, says the Lord. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You might say, well, I have given my life to him, uh, repented 15 years ago. God ain't talking about that. God is talking about today. Are you saved today? Are you serving him today? Are you walking with him today? Or is there things standing in the way between you and him and your heart and you know it? Hallelujah. Today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day uh, of, of your healing. Uh, salvation is much more than the word redemption. It is the word that means deliverance. It means protection. It means provision. It means uh, prosperity. It means uh, deliverance. Hallelujah. It means healing. Healing and restoration of your body. Healing and restoration of your mind and of your heart. Your soul, which is set in derision because of the traumatic things in the past. Hallelujah. Today is the day, God says, it begins. If you allow it, allow him to be set free. Oh, today is the day of the beginning, a new beginning, new beginning, new beginning. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. It's time to, to, to give those wishy-washy emotions. Uh, hallelujah. Bloodbath, the blood the, path in the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, to give them over to him and allow what he did on the cross to set you free, claim from the things that have bound you in the past, some things that you never told anybody else, but you have been traumatically experienced things in your life that have uh, held you bound there trigger points but God says today is the day to let them go because God knows everything about you God knows everything in, in your heart but God says now is the time to let them go don't use them as a crutch to get over on people and things and, and, and help you to, to as a crutch to go by in your life let them go let Jesus set you free today hallelujah Jesus Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. In Romans chapter 14, it says that, it says this, it says that, uh, it says that, that the, the uh, kingdom of God is not what you eat or drink, but it is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's not external things. It is not external stimuli or what happens around you, circumstance. It is righteousness, joy, and peace which are in the inside, which God gives you and God places inside your heart. And you live by that because of your relationship with the Lord Jesus himself. See, external stimuli did not give you the joy of the Lord, and the external stimuli cannot and will not take it out of you. Because joy is given is a, is a, is a God-given thing. It is a constant thing in your life. People fighting severe depression. You got to know what the joy of the Lord is. You, uh, you, to, you, oh, you got to hear what, what God is saying today. Because we're in the Advent season of preparing for his coming. And that's what Advent is all about, preparing for his coming. But not as a babe in the manger, but as a, a, a triumphal king reigning God supreme of all supremes, Lord of lords and king of kings, that's going to come and then have Gabriel before him with the shofar blowing it to call his beloved bride home. Glory to God. He's not in the manger anymore. He's not a man on the cross suffering. He's a triumphant reigning and ruling king of kings and lord of lords glory jesus we give you glory this morning 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's what it's all about. Hallelujah, Jesus. It's not about what you're going through physically because Jesus wants you to come to him and intimately get to know him. He wants to be your healer, but you don't know him as your healer. We play games in the church. We sing nice little songs and we hear it over again. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I Do you really love Jesus? Uh, church, come on. There's times I think we, we, we lie when we sing and worship. Sing songs like I can sing of your love forever on Sunday morning and not never any day else. What we give our passion time to is our passion. What we spend the most time is our passion. If your passion is if you spend time with the Lord, he's going to be your passion. And it's not just, oh, when I lay my life down, when I lay my, my head down to sleep. I mean, praying like you, you never prayed before. I'm talking about seeking him. I'm talking about spending time with him in fellowship prayer. When's the last time that you tell Jesus you loved him? and just spend time loving on him. When's the last time he woke you up and you said, no, I'm going back to sleep, I'm too tired. I'm too busy to be bothered by by him. See, oh, it's you, God. I, I got this important phone call. I'm talking to my friend, or I, I, I'm watching the big game, or I'm, I'm, I gotta do this. Oh, I gotta go out, or I gotta do this, or I gotta do that. What would it be if you had plans and God said, I want to spend time with you, and you called that person up and said, I gotta cancel because I gotta spend time with my Jesus? He wants to be with me. Do you really, really know him? He really wants to know you. Not know you just as some, oh, okay, he's, there's God, it's okay. You want to flow in the, you want the kingdom of God to be, you want to just, the kingdom of God just, just abound in your life? Hey, this is not like uh, like that song I did in my way. It's his way. It's his way. Or you could have the highway. His way or the highway. And he gives you the choice of his way or the highway. You know, that, that the scripture that says, narrow is the path that leads, leads to, uh, uh, to, to righteousness in the throne. But, but why narrow is the, wide is the path that leads to destruction? Wide is the path that leads to destruction. And, and beloved, I believe that, that Yes, it can lead. There are many people say, oh, that's about 
going to heaven and going to hell. Yes, I can apply to that. But it also could apply to the Christian's life. He was talking to religious people of the day. I'm not talking about going to hell. I'm talking about you want to go the wide road, go your own road. Is, your own road is the wide road. And that road leads to destruction. Leads to, to uh, embarrassment. Leads to heartache. There's also, there's also the, the fact that the ways of a transgressor is the ways of a transgressor is hard. It's hard. It's hard things upon yourself. Just being disobedient to what God wants for your life, it can be a sin, transgression. To know to do right and don't do it is what? Sin. I'm not talking about gross, blatant, outright, you know, drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. I'm not talking about sins of adultery and, and, and stuff. When you're disobedient to what God wants you for your life, Is it not sin? Missing the mark? Missing what God wants for our lives? What Jesus wants for our lives? And I, 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 I was speaking about preparation. Preparation of where it's coming. And that's what it is to be prepared in our hearts and our lives. I like what, what Romans chapter 14 says as well before that, that about, like when I said about the kingdom of God is not what we eat or drink, but it's righteous joy and peace in the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is. It talks about all kinds of stuff, external stuff that we put in and, and, and judging, bringing important judgment on people because, oh, they, uh, look at them, look at how they dress, they're not dressed like I'm dressed, and, and it's not external things. Jesus said, don't judge lest you be judged. That word it, what Jesus is talking about. If you have the same stuff in your life, don't pick out somebody, don't call the kettle black when you're a pot yourself. Or cast iron skillet. Because if you're dealing with the same thing, don't condemn somebody else because of, if you condemn them, the fingers are pointed back at yourself because you're dealing with the same thing or other things just like it. Beloved, you and I can be fruit inspectors, but we first must be pure of heart inside of us first. And, and it says if we're fruit, if you be a, want to be a fruit inspector, beloved, you got to listen to this. If you want to be a fruit inspector, James says to do that if you see a brother or sister that is at fault in at a fault at fault is sin. It says restore such a one, even saving them from the fire if need be of hell. He says do this with all humility and meekness and love. 
so that you don't go in the same way. Are we to be our brother's keeper? Yes. But beloved, you know, God sent the fivefold ministry into the into the and is still in the in, in existence today. He sent apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, so that you might be equipped and and, and grown and grown up and matured in, 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 in the fullness of Christ, using the plumb line of the word. But at times, and, and I welcome everybody on the internet as well, at times we say, well, I'm going to go somewhere else because I don't like what that preacher is the, or that pastor or that apostle or the prophet or that evangelist or teacher is, is saying. And it's the word of God. What you're saying is, I don't want to hear you, you God, or anything that you have to say. So I'm going to go from church to church to church to church to church because I'm not comfortable. In other words, I'm not, I, I don't want to be submitted. I don't want to be under your authority, God. And there's some people that, that, that might not be a right fit here. And there, there are some people that might not be a right fit down the Baptist church down the road or whatever. That's fine. But when you get to the place where you you know you feel in your heart you're supposed to be, stay and don't go. Because you're offended by the truth of the word of God. disagree with God. Okay, God. You know, that's what I do. There's people that tell me things and I don't like what they say sometimes when I, and, and, and it's the truth, you know. <laughs> Some people say, hey man, that was not really good. It's like, we could do one or two things. I, I, I could do this. I could say, oh, was it, I don't justify what I, things that I've done or said or anything like that. Or I could say, yes, God, I agree with you. Come on, somebody. We gotta agree with God. How could any 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 per person anyone come together? This is what the word of God this is God says. Jesus said this. Red letter edition. <laughs> he said, How can anybody come together unless to 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 agree on anything? Well actually it's a problem. The word of God says, you know, how can any person, anybody, anybody come together unless that they both agree? Sister Rose, she has, has this, the blue jacket on <laughs> and, and like blue, and she can say, oh, this is a pretty blue jacket. I could come up and say, any blue, that's, that's green, that's purple. What are you talking about? And I can argue with somebody all day, her all day long, but everybody knows it's a blue jacket. And isn't that what we in the body of Christ do sometimes? We argue about menial things of that nature. Argue and argue, oh, that's not right. This is, Jesus didn't weep in the Bible. That's the smallest verse in the Bible, by the way. Everybody should know that. Jesus wept. That's on all the, you know, the proverbial uh, quizzes and stuff that you take on, like, on my little quizzes on Facebook and stuff. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus didn't cry. Look at the movies. You know, if the movies said, you no, know, if Facebook said it, it's true. It's got to be 100% true, right? 
if the movies say it, it's got. I see it on the movie, and it's got to be true. We're living in a day and age. Everybody's against one another. Everybody says one thing or another. They say this is right and that's right. But well, there's only one thing, only one plumb line we got to line up with, which is the Word of God. Until we all come to the unity of the faith. Ephesians chapter 4, starting verse 11 on down, you read it. And that's what the frightful ministry is there for. That's why God still has people speaking his word, the truth. To, that we all line up with the full measure of the stature. You know what the measure is, the plumb line? Like I said, it's the word of God. And our lives got to measure up to that. As we prepare for the coming of the Lord, how do how are we preparing for the coming of the Lord individually? How are we preparing ourselves? And it's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. It is a moment-by-moment -moment thing that where we build an altar for the Lord. Like I said, we agree with the Lord if we fail or fall short. But then again, our relationship is everything. And I said it the other night on, at Friday Night United. And I say it here often and again and again, if you're sitting, why? We are too good, beloved, as his children to sin. Why are you given to sin? Stop because you're too good to sin. It's a relational thing. A relational thing. A sin thing in my life, it, it, it should be in everybody's life. That, that it's it's not that I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to do it to not just not go to hell, but it's a, God, I don't want to offend you because I love you so much. I don't want to break your heart. I don't want to grieve you. want to do things to mess up our relationship right standing with each other. So a continual openness of, of the doors of our hearts before the Lord so you come in as he pleases, comes in and sits on the throne of our hearts. What's on the throne of your heart, beloved? What's on the throne of your heart? Is materialism on your heart throne? Is relationships on the throne of your heart? For I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. That we place idols and things on the throne of our hearts where He desires to come and sit and rule and reign in our lives. Holy Spirit. Maybe we need to go and take examination of our lives and, and get rid of. The idols, the little trinkets. When I was in Thailand, we had to go into the house or the complex where we, we, we had the, the rented out for uh, our new world headquarters for WEC when I was a missionary with them. And we had a clean house, not only physically clean house because it was disgustingly dirty, 
but we had a clean house spiritually because they had these little God houses in the house itself. The little gods of their home, of, of the family, and they had little trinket idols of little demon looking creatures inside this little house in, in, the, in the complex itself. So, beloved, we had to go in and clean house, take that thing and get it out, the idols out. And we had to cleanse it by prayer and take an authority over everything other than the Holy Spirit. What do we have in our house? Not only internally, but externally. What do we have in our personal items that are idols? Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Not physically. In other words, he's saying if there's things that, that are that are or that you, you have that are, 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 are detrimental to your spiritual health, get rid of it. Maybe it's not only sin, but it's things that are weighing you down. Excess baggage and just being stuffed on your life. Maybe it's distractions distracting you from from the truth and reality of your relationship that God wants you to have with Him. Preparation for the coming of the Lord. Preparation. And some of us were preparing for Christmas, and, and there's a lot of people preparing for Christmas. There's a there's a Christmas vendor show over over the next door, next building. And there's people. The the, the parking lot is full over there with people coming in and out. You you, you can see them, and, and if they're over there, they're not attending church, and they're they're not do, doing things spiritually or anything. They're getting ready for Christmas. And people are busy this time of year and getting ready for Christmas. They're decorating the houses and they've got to decorate the outside because, you know what, it, it's warm and it's going to get the lights out and get the lights on the inside. And, uh, oh, gosh, you've got to get the shopping done because uh, you've got to buy all the gifts because if you don't get this, this, this person something, you know, ooh, everybody else got something, you know, they're going to be upset. Then you have the, the, the preparations for the, the Christmas dinner and everything else. And I know it's a few weeks away, but still planning. It's like, oh my gosh, where am I going to get the Christmas cookies? They're going to, this one down here, I'm going to call. No, you can't make the Christmas cookies here because they're all booked up. And you go out there, oh my gosh, they're too expensive out here. I don't want to pay that much. Then you go to Walmart and get the get the tray. And then they're putting the little cookies together for a dollar here, a dollar there. You know, like, Oh, look at that nice Christmas tray. Everybody's and the stores are packed. The the, the, the streets are are packed full of drivers going crazy, being, being kind of people off and being rude because they want to get to the sales and and all kinds of stuff. The malls are just jam packed because you know what? There's only a, a certain amount of shopping days before Christmas comes to prepare for Christmas. All for the sake of a jolly old health. some reindeer and they forget the true meaning of what Christmas is the whole meaning of Christmas is Christ mass the celebration of the coming of the, of the, the, the coming child that was born in Bethlehem the savior of the mankind named Jesus we too, as 
Christ's followers are preparing for another coming. Preparing not for a coming of a babe in the manger, but soon returning king. He wants to be the love of your life. He desires to be the love of our life. He needs to be the love of our life. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 1, I'm reading from the contemporary English version this morning. Years later, John the Baptist started preaching in the desert of Judea. He said, turn back to God. The kingdom of heaven will be here soon. John was the one prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, in the desert, someone is shouting, get the road ready for the Lord, make a straight path for him. John wore clothes of camels, carrying leather strap around his wrist and ate grasshoppers and wild honey. Oh, what a what a diet. That's the new diet plan. Grasshoppers and wild honey. Biblical diet plan here. From Jerusalem and all Judea and all the uh, from the river Jordan Valley, crowds of people went to John. They told how sorry they were for their sins, and he baptized them in the river. Many Pharisees and Sadducees, you know why they were sad, you see? You know why they were sad? Because they were Sadducees. Also came, they also came to but John said to them, you bunch of snakes, you warned, who warned you to run from the coming judgment? Do something to show that you really have given up your sins. And don't start telling yourselves that you belong to Abraham's family. I tell you that God can turn these stones into children of poor Abraham. An axe is ready to cut the tree down at its roots, and a tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown in the fire. Oh my goodness. I baptize you with water so that you will give up your sins, but someone is more powerful is going to come, and I'm not good enough even to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let me take a break right there. We need the fire of God to come, because of the fire of God is his passionate desire that burns inside of him. And some people have Holy Spirit and they've been baptized the Holy Spirit and and, and and that's fine and dandy, but it's not just a one day thing. It's an everyday thing that we're filled up the overflowing mess of the Holy Spirit and fire. He wants to fill you up and burn you up place you with his passion that burns before him and him alone. His threshing fork is in his hand and he is ready to separate the wheat from the husk. He will store the wheat in the barn and burn the husk in the fire that never goes out.
coming. He's not coming in the sense what even John, because he was preparing the uh, one that sent to prepare the way uh, for the coming Messiah, in which he would solve. And he baptized him in the river Jordan. And we saw that Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit in fire. And he went out preaching and everything, and right afterwards, oh my goodness, thousands of people got healed and delivered everything. No, he was led to go into what the wilderness, the barren area. We're talking not about preparing for the Santa and jolly old elves, I'm talking about something more serious. We got to make preparations for even a greater time that is coming. Isaiah 40, verse 3 and 5 says, Listen, there is something, someone shouting, Prepare a way in the desert, for the Lord makes straight the road. There is before our God. Even valleys must be filled. Every mountain and hill should be made flat. The crooked roads should be made straight, and the rough ground made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be shown on to everyone. Together all the people will see it. Yes, this is what the Lord himself said. And this was hundreds of years before the Jesus would be born in the manger in Bethlehem or out in the, the uh, tower of the flock outside of Bethlehem. God had prepared one of his prophets named Isaiah here to bring forth the word that foretold the coming of his son. In fact, even in eternity past, at the beginning, God made a declaration to mankind of his coming. In Genesis 3.15, it says, I will make you the wo and the woman enemies to each other. Your children and her children will be enemies. You will bruise her, her child's foot, but he will crush your head. I'm talking about the coming Messiah here. He's talking to the devil himself. He's saying, one day her child, her, her great, 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 great grandchild, not born of woman, but born of Holy Ghost, will bruise your, you'll bruise his foot. In other words, you'll put him on the cross, but when he raises on the third day, he will crush you. In the beginning, it's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God declares it. God is the God of order and preparation here. <laughs> he leaves nothing to chance, and that's why his plans never fail. put a plan together in advance. And we read in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, years later, John the Baptist started preaching in the desert of Judea. He said, turn back to God, the kingdom of heaven will soon be here. And John was just another prophet like Isaiah. He was talking the same thing. When he said that in the desert someone is shouting, get the road ready for the Lord, make a straight path for him. There were preparations that, 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 that the Father decreed that should be completed before his son, the light would be presented into the dark and dying world. And so we find John the Baptist here, a man filled with Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was sent to make those preparations. 
And what was John's message? <coughs> Excuse me. And what can we learn from his life in, in this preparation time that we're preparing not only for the, the uh, celebration of Christ's birth, but, but we're preparing our lives for his return. Not only his return, but certainly for our own eternity. So let's look at some lessons learned here from John the Baptist. Number one, in verse one, we see that John the Baptist was ministered, John the Baptist rather ministered in the desert not in the plus palaces of the cities or the temple. He was in the desert. People probably thought he was a crazy person living out in the desert. Got a coat of wool. Ate locusts and honey. The word desert, it means forsaken, hence uninhabited as a desert isle, wild, untilled, waste, uncultivated. John the Baptist ministered in the type of place that Jesus ministered to people at the place where people's hearts were. They were barren and uh, from the truth of salvation. They were barren from the truth. We see Jesus was the same way. He ministered. He didn't minister in the in in the, in the palace. He didn't come in the palace. He was born in 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 the, in the, in the tower of the flock. Used for the sacrificial lambs in the temple itself for the atonement of sin. Uh, I'll preach. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 to 13, it talks a little bit about that. And it happened Jesus reclined in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclined with them and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw what they came running in, they said this, Why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? But Jesus heard. He said to them, The one who uh, are whole do not need a physician, but the ones who are sick. But go and learn what this is. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And we find later in this chapter that it is in the desert place that he finds Jesus. In fact, many of the people did not find Jesus. Jesus found them. It is in the desert place that we find Jesus. The people who are desperately in need of a Savior. It's also in that place Jesus finds them through you and I. Where is this place that Jesus is and that he declares, come find me? And where you, can, you and I can find Jesus, it's in the schools, it's in your workplaces, it's in the grocery stores. It's on the streets, it's in the bars, it's in the crack houses, it's in the jails, it's in the hospitals, you name it. And Jesus, in fact, Jesus says in Matthew 25, it says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. Jesus is. Glory to God. Romans chapter 8 says, All creation 
is groaning or waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. They're waiting to see Jesus to be manifest here on earth through the church. The church is you and I. They're waiting to see something real. And number two, we're, we're in, in verses two and three, we see John the Baptist his first and foremost priority in ministry was the lost, reaching out to those who were destitute of salvation. He was a sign that pointed everyone to Jesus. Beloved, we too must be a sign that points or leads people to Jesus. We need to be a sign that points or leads people to Jesus. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. First of all, our light is to shine. Our first priority is, number one, is numero uno, our hearts to be pure before the Lord so that he could he can shine through us if you ha don't have a light or your light burned out you can't shine if your relationship with Jesus is yelled null and void you can't shine How's your relationship with the Lord? Number two is making it hard for people to go to hell in your sphere of influence. Making it hard for people to go to hell in our sphere of influence. Letting your light shine before all men that they may glorify your God who is in heaven. The beloved, that's what John the Baptist did. He was just someone, a signpost that pointed to Jesus. And we too must be a signpost that points to Jesus in our life, our actions and our words. Number three, John the Baptist didn't promote or exalt himself. He was a humble man. He went through the low door. In fact, God was the one who endorsed him in verse three. We need to take John the Baptist's example to live humble before the Lord. And we read the... scriptures over and over again about humility. First Peter chapter 5 and James talks about humility and all that stuff. We need to be humble before the Lord. Putting everything over on the Lord. Casting all of our anxiety over to Him. Everything. The God, I, I just humble I guess it's a low door. It's not me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, but it's, I'm crossed out. The I is crossed out. I no longer live, but Christ lives in through my life. Number four, John the Baptist spoke of the truth and love. He spoke the truth and love. As seen in verses 7, 10, he didn't sugarcoat the gospel. We must allow his example and speak the truth and love and not sugarcoat anything, especially the gospel. The word of God 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. So that we no longer may be infants, babies. I want some, I want some milk. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and the dishonesty of men and cunning craftiness to the wiles of the sea. But when you speak, when but that you, rather speaking the truth in love, may in all things grow up to him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love, it's talking about the word of God coming from your heart and your life. Even the hard things, speaking it to them in love. You can speak the truth to somebody, but if it's not in love, guess what? You sound like a junkyard dog and nobody else is going to want to listen to it. But if you speak all happy, happy, joy, joy, all oh, that nonsense to people, that's what they're going to be puffed up. Oh, great. I'm doing great. But God wants us to speak the truth in love. That they may grow up and be mature people in Christ. There's far too many people out there in the church that have been that are, are either immature, immature in that they're they're puffed up. Oh, and this is a great word. I just love it. I'm puffed up. And there's no truth to it, and there's people that are uh, are are pushed out because it, it's the truth, but not in love. It's more time that we begin to speak the truth in love, and if people reject that; they're not rejecting you; they're rejecting Christ, or they're rejecting the Word of God. Some people, I believe, they don't want to grow up. Turn to somebody, turn to somebody, and say it's time to grow up. Number five. In closing here. John the Baptist lived a life in, in in word and deed that was about Jesus. Everything was about. The coming was everything was about him. That wasn't just because, man. That was that's my cousin, man. You, you, you just don't know it because he didn't really realize who Jesus. I mean, Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't really know. If he did, he'd say, "Hey, man, come on over here. That's my cousin. He's the Messiah." It was only when he, he saw Jesus, he knew that he was, oh, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. I've been waiting for He lived a life in the word and deed that was about Jesus. We need to live a life in the word and deed that exemplifies Jesus everywhere we are and everywhere. Colossians 3.17 says this, in everything, in everything, it just doesn't say some things. Something, no. Everything. And everything, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything that you do and everything you say, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God and, by, uh, to, the, uh, and to the Father by Him. Everything you do and everything you say bring glory to Him in your life. People listen to testimonies from people that, uh, that are uh, a revivalist and they're like, wow! Your life is just so awesome. Look at that. Get on airplanes, talk to people about, hey, you over there. Uh, uh, your name is John. How you doing? You have the blah, 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 blah in your life. 
people think, oh, man, that'd be cool. That'd be awesome to do and have, have, be able to do and have. That comes become a, because of a relationship you have with him. Because he gives you his heart and his heart's for people. And he begins to open people's hearts to you that you may see that you may be able to minister to them. It's not a psychic thing because psychic is other enemy, the devil himself. It's not just for something else. Say, oh, you'd be good. Oh, that's cool. You get on the phone and gossip because, oh, you should see what they did. They have in their lives. No, it's not. If you're have that in your heart you gotta quit that's what simon the sorcerer wanted to say hey peter guess what i want what i, I want that i could i can make a oh that'd be cool to have in my my repertoire as a, a, a sorcerer Woo, yes they said no it's not for you it's not what it's about read the story Simon the sorcerer one, hey, hey, they're getting baptized. Oh, that's cool. I want some of that too. I to get, oh, I need that in my repertoire of, of, of chants and stuff. Oh, that'd be great. Probably would get a few, uh, a few chunk of change off of that. And we get on to uh, Ellen DeGeneres show and all that stuff book, uh, whatever his name, the Colbert show on, on Tonight Show, and get, get, uh, hey, you know, it, this, this is the person that, 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 that tells you your life. Huh. It's not about that. It's about pointing people to Jesus and people getting healed. And it comes by a relationship with him. As it says here in Colossians, that everything, whatever you do in word and deed, everything, it's all in the name of Jesus, giving praise and honor to him. As John the Baptist said, I decrease and him increase. Others won't, might not see my face anymore, but they'll see Jesus. thing is we live in the realms so much in this temporal realm so much that we forget about what Colossians chapter 3 says and, and verses 1 through 3 it says see since you're dead to, to, to everything else you're alive to Christ set your set your affections and everything on things above and not on earth we think just in this temporal realm here oh uh, from church to to, to the Wendy's and to go home and watch the football game and then go to a uh, Christmas program maybe here or there or whatever else we have to do or go to sleep early because we had a long weekend of parades and everything else. Oh, and this week we think about, oh my gosh, got to go to the doctors and I got to go here to the, to the uh, what is that, the, to the <laughs> massage or or physical therapy. <laughs> I got to do this, got to do that. We live in the realm. We think too much uh, 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 in the church at times on the things that of this temporal realm that we forget that we're spiritual. We're spiritual beings that are passing through this world. This is not your home. In fact, in the light of eternity, it's very, 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 very short time. And that's why we got to be prepared for his coming. And I feel in my heart that, and, and, and other other people in the church have felt this too, that, that he's going to return soon, sooner than what we think. And we got to be prepared for, for his coming prepared oh, not only in, internally but pre be prepared to be ministers for him ministers of reconciliation as the word says that we are ministers of ministers of reconciliation the lost and dying world that only comes first by a relationship with the Lord that you just totally sold out to him 
that he's your first and only love, that compared to him, not, nothing else matters. That, that, that it's not about if I sin God I'll, I'll go to hell no if I sin God I'll grieve your heart I'll grieve your heart because it's a love thing a deep passionate love thing that he wants to restore you. He wants to restore the church. In fact, the word he gave for this upcoming year is a paradigm shift that's coming in, in, in the, the, to, to the world. There's a paradigm shift. There's a shaking coming. It, it's something that is so, so profound. profound and I have not yet wrapped my, my my focus around that yet the word for 2019 but I know it, 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 it's it's coming to that place of a, a, a shift a shaking a sifting and, and and the shift has to do with I don't know if you play board games, but I don't like the board games myself because they take a long time. And, it, and there's a game called Risk, and the on in Risk there's certain pieces on there that you you place and you, you're like different armies <laughs> that you're you I, I believe you're taking over other lands and and, and these puzzle pieces in this great big scheme of things I'll just share this with you if they're all on preparation right the word hope is the first week of Advent the hope of his coming and the hope of his shift the shift is that I see the God's hand just take up different puzzle people like these like these figures in this game and place them in strategic places and begin to take them and shift them in the place where they need to be. <laughs> Preparation. Preparation for his return. Or like I said, his word says that he is all creation, rather, is longing. It says it's groaning. It's oh, longing with a deep groaning desire for the sons and daughters of God to manifest Jesus on the earth. As the waters cover the ocean, so my glory, my presence covers the earth. Let's prepare our hearts for his coming. Not only is his return when he comes and Gabriel blows the shofar, the trumpet. Eastern sky, but it's coming, it's manifestation in the sons and daughters of God here on earth. Let us prepare our hearts that our hearts <laughs> might be ready for Jesus to shine through us in this manifestation of Jesus on this earth. Lord, we just thank you for the day. We thank you for the word, a preparation of hope, uh, of your coming, your return. You return not only that, that you're going to come in, in the sky and, and gather us together with you. 
as we hear the trump as we hear the shofar of gabriel blowing it and we're all gathered and we're all transformed in the twinkling of an eye all this corruption put on incorruption immortality put on immortality put on immortality our bodies being changed transformed but also to prepared in our own heart and life now Lord as you search continually to search our hearts as we prepare as we are your beloved to manifest you on the earth now But you receive all the glory and honor. It's a fiery love relationship you desire, Lord God. Come and manifest yourself inside of us. Examine and search for it. That we might, Lord God, Oh, surrender to you everything in a, in a new freedom not just a sense of religion Lord God I come against the spirit of religion take authority over it in Jesus name but a sense of freedom a sense of liberty in Jesus name Lord God in your house your church and your people, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Everything in do and word and deed be done to glorify you, Jesus. Come fresh, Holy Spirit and fire. In Jesus' name, and baptize everyone fresh and new. Let us walk this word out every day. Continually. In Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his sounds upon you and grant you his peace. Shalom. Nothing broken, nothing lacking. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ.